skeptic to Bitcoin believer. And then there's this seismic eureka moment where all, all of a sudden you're saying to yourself, wait a minute, I understand what this is now. I understand why I need to be invested and why I'm at the front of a early stage project. I'm at the frontier of something. Can you take us through that odyssey from Bitcoin skeptic to Bitcoin believer, but then also putting uh, your money where your mouth is? Over the last decade, we had progressive monetary expansion in the level of 5% a year, which was significant to people that were sensitive to it. But for people in the tech industry or people that were busy with some other part of their life, we could live with 5% monetary expansion uh, and still go about our jobs. And so I was a big tech enthusiast and I was really, uh, really uh, occupied by my business until we got to 2020. And in that context, everything I knew about Bitcoin for the first decade was like noise. Like I know it's something interesting and there's some people that care a lot about it, but it's noise and I'm really more concerned about what the next iPhone is going to be or what Facebook is going to do or the con uh, the Im implications of Amazon rolling over 15,000 retail companies. and. And those were all very exciting stories for a decade. And then I think we got to 2020, we got the K-shaped recovery. Main Street locked down, Wall Street had a V-shaped recovery. The monetary expansion jumped from 5% to 20 or 25%. Now you couldn't ignore the fact that the, the money supply was expanding. Now, now, you could, now all of the interesting stories of the last decade, you know, the Amazon story is over. We know how that ends, right? They win. The Google story, the Apple story, the, the Facebook story, they're all over. We know how they end. It's pretty clear. They're going to go on to another stage, but it's not a technology play. Now it becomes about politics and society. And so now we all have a problem in 2020. The problem is the money supply is expanding. And then you realize if you're trying to make money doing it the 20th century way, you know, it, it's just really hard. And if you're trying to make money the 21st century way, you got to do it virtually. The virtual wave hit us. And so I would say I became really interested in Bitcoin the second quarter of this year. I realized that this had the potential to be digital gold. It felt like digital gold that no institutions had quite embraced, but a lot of early adopters had embraced. And everybody wants, in an expansion, uh, expansionary economy where the money supply is expanding, you all want sound money. And the previous sound money for 5,000 years was gold, mostly sound, expanding 2 3% a year. Bitcoin is digital gold, thermodynamically perfectly sound money. In theory, on a sheet of paper, if God designed gold with no imperfections, he would have designed Bitcoin. It's like, well, this is too good to be true. You just got to figure out, you know, is it going to be hacked? Is it going to be banned? Is anybody else going to buy into it? What's the problem? Because it looks perfect. And we we got involved because we, not because it was elective. If I had a 5% problem each year, I could have ignored it. But when it became a 20% problem, I couldn't ignore it. We were forced after March of 2020 to embrace the issue. So we got into it and we embraced it, not because we thought Bitcoin was risk-free. Bitcoin was $9,000, $10,000 a coin. There's a lot of controversy in April, May, June, even July, August. We figured uh, the certainty of losing half your purchasing power over four years was enough of a, enough compensation to justify taking the risk of doing something new, right? A guarantee, and that's why we got into it. The next six months, you can see the story, which is maybe it's digital gold, maybe the institutions need this thing to, well, I guess some need it, to more of them need it, and then it goes to 20,000, 30,000, and 40,000. And I think as we enter 2021, you know, people's perception is rotated to, I guess it is digital gold and it's the newest institutional safe haven asset. And by the way, it looks to me like uh, monetary expansion is, is continuing. Everybody's got an asset inflation problem. It's top of mind for every investor. What are we going to do about it? And so that's how we kick off the year as uh, I speak to you. 
So it was with a group of people. We've obviously launched our fund uh, in good part thanks to your help and your intellectual gravitas and helping us get around to this. My, my eureka moment alongside of yours was understanding something you said last time we were together about it being a digital network, a digital platform for money, similar to an Amazon for retail or say a Google for search and advertising or Facebook for social networking. Uh, but I was with what I would call the rat poison crew. Uh, it was a group of uh, men and women, but mostly men in their 70s and 80s that were buying into the Warren Buffett idea that Bitcoin is rat poison. Now, Bill Miller said, well, it may be rat poison, but the rat might be fiat currency. Uh, so Bit Bill is a believer like you and I. Uh, but one thing that keeps coming up repetitively, Michael, I have my take, but I really want to hear yours, is, well, what the hell is it? It's just a encrypted code. Uh, there's 21 million of them, okay, so I get the scarcity. But why would that be worth anything? if all it is is a code in the ether, and this is from the rat poison crew, and so your response to that would be, how did you get over that hurdle? It's uh, digital gold. Anybody could design code for digital gold, but is digital gold on the dominant monetary network in the world? So if I had an idea for Twitter, and I thought I was gonna launch a speech network, anybody could copy it but at the point that everybody on earth joined twitter and they all looked at twitter for half an hour an hour a day you got 400 million people pouring 400 million hours of bandwidth per day into twitter then it's not the software anymore then it's a digital speech network it's the dominant digital speech network for public speech i think in the last decade, you saw dominant networks form for speech on Twitter. You saw a dominant video network in YouTube. You saw a dominant mobile network for Apple. You saw a dominant social network. You saw a dominant retail network in, in Amazon. Each of these things gathered uh, the commitment of a billion people. Warren Buffett talks about brand. Warren Buffett would understand Coke. The, the, the power of the brand of Coca-Cola is if I obliterated every Coca-Cola plant and every bottle of Coke everywhere on earth, I couldn't get it out of the minds of 7 billion people. 7 billion people know that it, what a Coca-Cola is. And so the brand of, uh, of having that idea stuck in the minds of billions of people is very powerful.